Today we're with John Daniel at his shop in Richmond, Virginia. John, thanks for, for inviting us in to take a look around. I'm delighted to have you. I love my shop and I'm happy to show it. Well, that's great. We're looking forward to seeing it. Good. John joined uh, Richmond Woodturners in 2018 and is a pretty regular contributor to the show and tell and challenges that we have, I've noticed. You joined the club in 2018. Is that when you started turning? No, not really. Um, probably uh, 10 years before that, I started. But to say I started meant I started dabbling in it. Uh, okay. As I'll probably say various times uh, through this, I started with a shopsmith, and I think shopsmiths are great. I am not one of these people who will uh, criticize shopsmith, but it has its limitations. And I decided on a lark one day when I didn't have something to do to go set up the shopsmith in lathe mode. I had never used it before that. Curiosity. Curiosity. Okay. Yep. And so I found some wood. I didn't even have any wood. I remember I had to glue three pieces of wood together to get a turning something. Mm -hmm. And I put it in there, had to search for, the, um, uh, for, for points to put it in, for turning centers to put it in. But anyway, I did that, and I created what I thought was a spectacular bowl. And I got hooked. But because of work demands, different things, I really didn't get started with Ernest until three years before I joined the club. And that's when I got into it, still with the shopsmith. Started turning pins, then moved to um, some small bowls, moved back to pins, improved what I was doing with that, saw different things. I got caught up in um, non-kit pins, okay. stick pins, mm -hmm. desk pins, and uh, had a lot of fun trying. I blew up a lot of them, but having, you know, trying to do mm -hmm. it and finally found a little bit of a sweet spot. Gave a lot of them away, and uh, so it all just drew me in. I didn't even know about the club for the longest time. And I can't really remember how I found out about it, but after the first meeting, I knew I've got to come to this. It's a source. It's a great yep. source. Yeah. Uh, did you keep your first bowl? I did. It's up on my, I should have brought it down here. Uh, it's on our dresser in our bedroom. And uh, I think of all the things I've done, my wife will never part with that bowl. Yeah, always keep your first bowl. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I have it. I do have it. Well, we're standing against or next to a, a very beautiful 100-year anniversary powermatic lathe. Is this your, is this your primary lathe? It is. It, is uh, it really is the only lathe that I now have. Um, I love this lathe. Um, it obviously is a powermatic. I started with the shopsmith, as mm -hmm. I said. And um, I still love the shopsmith and thinking about how to continue to use it. But from there, I migrated uh, to, I decided I wanted to get a lathe per se, my own real lathe. So I searched around and I made the mistake that probably too many people make. That is, I bought too small in the beginning. I bought a Laguna 1216. I love the lathe. It is a great lathe. I would recommend it to anybody, but I outgrew it in about a year. And what I outgrew was I started turning larger and larger stuff and wanting to, to create hollowed vessels, and it didn't have the power that I needed. So I decided I'm going to sell it, see what I can get for it. I sold it for more money than I paid for it, to a young man who is really gifted but had a specific need that he wanted to use that lathe for. And I felt I almost did good in that because he was so thrilled to buy that lathe. And so he has it, he's using it, and I focused on this. What and do you like about the, logo, or the, uh, the Powermatic? Oh, golly. First of all, the power that it has compared it's a, to what I have. 220. It's 220. It's 220. Um, and it's, it's the right length for me. If I could have one accessory, if it's still available, is I would have a, a lift away or, or lean over, I don't know what they call them, a pneumatic deal that would take this and roll it over to the side like Robust and others have. Um, it's a bit of a bear lifting this thing off. This model is even heavier than the older model. Um, but that's the only thing that I would change. I would say that the banjo is heavier than it needs to be. 
it's, it's just a bit of weight moving around, but that plays well on a big piece. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a trade-off, a smaller piece. So I've gotten some smaller tool rests to use on smaller pieces, which helps with that. Um, the speed is great. I don't change the, belts, the belt a whole lot because I stay in a range that it can handle. And I, and I opt for power as opposed to, to speed. I do so change it some. It's variable speed within the belt ranges. It is. It is. And uh, I don't know how accurate the digital readout is. I don't really care. It tells me about what I'm at. So um, the, I, I haven't had any trouble with the lathe, none. The challenge I've had is getting it to stay put. It'll, it walks on me. And I think it's what I did in the beginning. So I, I got it set up. I got it where I thought it was just right. And I realized there were only three feet really hitting the floor, even though it didn't rock when I moved it. So I had to develop a system to be able to lift up 780 pounds or whatever it is. That's not easy. So I got a little hydraulic jack and built some things above it, and I could crank that up and easily lower it down and test it back and forth, and it became an easy way to adjust the feet. So right now, it doesn't walk so much, even with a big piece out of balance. It will if it's really out of balance, as I think everybody knows. If I could, and I knew it would never change, I'd probably put anchors down in the floor and bolt it to the floor. But I'm not about to do that at this point. Um, it is everything I had hoped for. Um, it, it meets my needs and then some. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been very pleased. I have this model simply because it was a special when I went to buy it. I didn't want a particularly, I didn't particularly want a black lathe, although it was fine. I'd had one or a special edition, but this was a little sweeter deal, so why not? Of course, it doesn't show any dust. Never shows dust. And I'm always so neat with CA glue, I never splatter any of it, you know. So uh, that's what the towel is for. I've learned to cover my, uh, my um, ways with, with a towel when I get ready to do some of those things because I've had to chip some glue off. So. I don't see a lot of tools behind, behind the lathe. You, you haven't know? talked to my wife. She, well, she would, thinks she would say many. there's a ton back there. Um, no, actually, it's very few. <laughs> well, I guess I'm no different than anyone else. I'm always on the hunt for a new tool or something. But I have found some that I really um, use a lot and like to use. And so when I look at some, some newer gouges and things particularly, I'm thinking, why do I need that with what I have? And if I can't come up with a reason, I don't just get it because it's available. I really love uh, Thompson tools. This is not an ad for Thompson, but I, I love the handles. They're really heavy. They're weighty. I like that. The steel, I think it's really good steel. I don't know the technicalities of steel engineering and metallurgy. But I seem to take less steel off in sharpening with a Thompson than I do others. That said, I probably use my Ellsworth gouge, which may or may not have a true Ellsworth grind on it, but it's the one I have. And I probably use it 90% of the time in the end because of the different ways I can cut with it without having to put something down or pick up something else. So um, I'm not a fan of carbide. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't criticize carbide. I don't know enough to do so. I have a hollowing carbide tool, and I have a, a, a woodpecker carbide tool. I do use those some. I recently turned a piece of LVL, you may remember, and the carbide tool was the only thing that would really turn that. So, aha, why do I have this? I have the carbide tool to do this. So I don't know. I, I, yes, will I get more tools? I probably will. As I'm often heard to say, I think wood turning has a disease element to it that you just have to keep feeding to keep it at bay. So, um, yeah. I love the ones I've got. I use everything up there constantly, and i um, glad I got it. I know you do some hollow forms. Yes. What hollowing tool do you use? 
I, um, as you know, went through a, a, a kind of an analysis in my mind. I analytically think things through. I don't just go get the first thing that impresses me. So I really started with an easy wood hollower, and it cut great, and I thought I found the tool until I got a little distance off the tool rest, and it almost hit me in the face. It just keeps bouncing. So started looking and looked at all of the ones that were out there and considered what I do and decided that the Jameson tool mm -hmm. was the one for me. I, I thought, well, is it going to be hard to set up? Is it going to take a long time to set up? No. Um, and after I used it in kind of a trial, I saw this is really the thing that I want. So I got it and have used it uh, right much. And you can see above you there, I have it mounted out of the way, but easy access to me in some pop mounts so I can just pull it right down and put it on the lathe. But I really like that. Well, that's that's uh, that's it's a good it's it's a good hollowing tool. I'm I'm going to be interested in in walking around and taking sure. a look at your shop. But before we do, uh, you know these these shop tours we've been in basements and standalone buildings and in uh, or sheds and we've been in almost closets and we've <laughs> been in uh, spare rooms. Can you tell me a little about about where are we? What what, okay. what are we standing in? Well, I'm actually glad you asked that. Um, we decided, uh, when I retired, to move into the city of Richmond. Uh, my wife has always loved old houses, and I said, my deal is I'm not buying a fixer-upper, so I'm not interested in spending the last season of my life fixing up a house. And so we decided to do that, but I said, I have to have a place that has a workshop or that I can create a workshop in. We found this house built in 1932 and where we are is a small one car garage that is out behind uh, the house. So this building was built in 1932. Uh, it, it is a cinder block. As you can see from the color, it's gray cinder block. It's a dense cinder block. I don't know again the technicalities of that. But there's something about this that makes it very brittle. But this structure was built in 32, and when I came into it, uh, there was nothing here but a temporary wall, which I tore out. But the floor was at a very steep angle, and that wouldn't work. So I knew I had to level the floor. And a long story made short, I had trouble finding some people who would actually fix that because everybody wanted to tear the floor out, but they were afraid they would collapse the old building. So I finally found a young man who, very professional, said yes, he could do it. He too wanted to take the floor out, and he thought the walls would be okay, but he said, I can do it without doing that. And uh, so he did, and this building has about 10 inches more concrete behind me at the end than it has up here. And he leveled that out. It's not perfectly level, but it's within an inch, and that's the best he could do and maintain the height of the building. So it is, it is, it is in a historic area. I mean, Richmond's full of old historic homes. And as old as it can be, I actually like the old place. It has character to it, um, some charm in its, in its, um, its age. But there was one light bulb here, so it has been electrified, uh, full service. It has been, um, it now has HVAC, which I put in, and um, it has all the, the accoutrements with it. But it's just an old building that we decided to maintain its age and sort of its historicity as it fits in that age group of architecture and keep the outside as it is, but the inside as it is, just make it into a wood shop. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So we're in a uh, an historical shop. Historical. I guess you could say that. <laughs> I guess you could Add say that. Add another one to the list. That's right, that's right. Uh, could you kind of walk around and, and show me what sure. what you've got here? Well, I, I took some paper when I came in and drew out what I wanted. Um, as you can see, these drawers, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in having drawers to put things in. Um, some of the drawers are very orderly and some look like a hurricane came through it, but nonetheless, it's, it's good storage and it keeps stuff away and put up. 
it's categorized in a way that I understand it. Uh, and as I was telling you earlier, I, I made a decision to get things that were already constructed and I found used office equipment and went to a place one day and told the guy what I was doing and he said, well, you can just have this stuff. So this big cabinet, which works perfectly, other filing cabinets, some of the cabinetry actually is just old office equipment. It's just a way to meet a need without a major investment and it really works well. So then I had to think about other storage. So when I came in, I thought, where in the world am I going to put things? I couldn't do what was the ideal because these are actually doors that open. So I wanted to maintain that ability. I mean, if this puppy ever goes away, I got to have a way to get it out of here. So I read an article about a French cleat wall. Well, I built one. Maybe it isn't the prettiest one around, but it is, it is amazingly functional. So I can move things around and keep testing things, put new little gizmos up there, and I absolutely love it. So all of the pieces, all the sections on that wall are all movable because of a cleat, Absolutely. cleat system. Absolutely. Okay. So I have immense functionality, and I do find myself sometimes uh, rearranging that. I mean, ideally, I'd like my lathe tools to be right here. But reaching across has never been a problem, so that's, as, that's equally as close. So anyway, I had to do that, and then um, came along. Sharpening station, I was always taught, needs to be as close to the lathe as you can get it. So I, I first built a little stand, worked perfectly, put the sharpening system on it, placed it here. It's an easy trip over here to sharpen and come back. It doesn't, doesn't get in, in the way. So then I need a table saw. I don't use a table saw every day, but I need a table saw. So I keep my shop smith. I think I was telling you earlier, my dad gave me that as the first tool. It's 40 years old and still works perfectly. There are issues with it, but Shopsmith's good stuff. And so I keep it, I use it as a table saw. It stays pretty much in that position, but it has an upgraded ro um, caster system that it'll easily, with, a, with one hand, it'll roll around any place I want it. So I put in the... Um, vacuum system, put it over in the corner. It's out of the way, but I can easily get to it to um, change the bags. And a bandsaw. A wood turner's got to have a bandsaw. And um, a friend of mine had a, had a very elaborate shop. I mean, a shop that any of us would dream of having. He got cancer, and he was selling off his, his tools. And I tried to buy this one from him because he had it. And he ended up giving it to me. After all, it's right now over 40 years old, so Powermatic lasts. There are things about it. It's small, but so far it's worked for me. It's on casters, so I move it around. I roll it around. Came over here, and I just tucked my planer back there. Um, I, I, can't, I off and on use that heavily. That I'll go a period of time and not use it. But then I come up on something and I, that I'm making and I've got to have a planer. So there, there it is. Put the chop saw here. And if anybody has a, has a true solution for the de dust of a uh, chop saw, I'd sure love to know about it because I can coat the whole place in it. Put my little wood storage up here, the ends and pieces and some fairly nice little wood. Uh, and then up here in the corner, I put the first workbench that I made years ago and was in my garage in Midlothian. And we got ready to move and I was just gonna leave it. And my daughter said, Daddy, you're not gonna leave that. You gotta go out there and cut that thing in half. So I cut it in half with a skill saw and brought it and it's perfect for the shop here. Just nestles right in there. And there you have it. So sometimes, and, and I want you to know it always looks that way. It just always <laughs> all looks shops. Every shop we've ever been in always they're looks always just pristine, like that. Yes. aren't they? Yeah. Yep. My mother taught me when companies come and you clean the house. But uh, anyway, um, so that's kind of the tool chest back there, which I don't know whether you see can see, is again from my dad. Uh, that is, I think, best guesstimate, over fifty years old. It's an old craftsman chest. It still works fine, so for sentimental reasons, I keep my hand tools and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. 
So that's kind of how I put it this way. I wanted space in the middle as much as I could have. Well, in this building you don't get but so much. So I try to keep this clear so mm -hmm. I don't kill myself stumbling over stuff. And um, it, it, it works. I, the air filtration system I added up there, and that, um, that has been an asset. So I do, as I was showing you, I do have to, um, you know, you, you have to live in a marriage with give and take. So when I got the, the shop and there was no place to put the freezer, there had to be a little give and take. So I house the uh, family freezer out here, and that's okay. It takes a little space, but, you know, not that much in, in total. My, my liquids are around by the door up there on a, on a shelf. I don't keep a lot of those, but the finishes and denatured alcohol and mineral spirits are over there. In your sharpening, what do you know what grit stones you're using? I and do. I also noticed that you've got a... You've got a diamond wheel in addition to a, a regular stone wheel. Um, I, um, I, decide, I bought the Rikon motor, again, because of the economy of it. And it's been great, no problems. Um, it came with two stones. This is an 80 stone. It came with, a, I think, a 40 and an 80 or something like that. When I decided to get the CBN, I debated uh, back and forth long and hard had an interesting conversation with a guy named Ken Rizza, who owns wood, wood turning wonders or whatever, mostly sandpaper and things, but CBN wheels. And this is a 180 CBN wheel. And I can, I can do rough shaping here and then do the rest of it here. And I have not myself found that I needed to go to a higher grit than this. I think I probably do but I'm just not good enough at it to see that I need to. Um, but this is a 180, so I'll, I'll do any rough shaping. If I change the end of a tool, I'll start here and get it to a point, then I'll move over here and finish it. And that seems to work for me, but that's what's up here. I, don't ha I just have the jigs that came, I mean the, the attachments that came with the one way. I do have for the Ellsworth tool, I have his... Um, his jig for that, and I use that when I use his tool. Um, so I put it on this rolling cart, and you know, again, drawers hide everything. So everything's categorized. I can easily, he still have one empty, um, have certain things in certain places, and I know exactly where they are, so I can go to them quickly. If I have to move this, it's on casters, um, but it works well. So 80 and 180. 80. 80 and 180, right. I think there was a 60, I don't know whether it had been a 40, but there was a rougher grit, a coarser grit on here when I bought it. I believe mm -hmm. that's right. And I still have that somewhere down in here. Okay, and looking at the bandsaw, it looks like you've made a fence. I have. So your, 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 your clamping system is what stabilizes it? It does, and uh, works really well. Um, it, it is truly an Abrams tank. I just can't, I can't do anything that'll, that, that'll cause it to hiccup at me. I've broken a few blades, but it was my own stupidity. And I have found how to order this. These blades are not readily available, but stare it, stare it, however you say that, they're happy to custom make blades at reasonable prices. So I just buy them three at a time from them on the internet and um, I get them in a couple of days. So it's good, pretty good with dust extraction. Um, it's very old, um, runs like a top. I just can't part with it, but I would sure love to have a 14 inch bandsaw. I would love to have. I would say that might be the thing if I was going to upgrade. If I found a great home for this, I might upgrade to a full 14 inch, but I'd have to think that through. Uh, you mentioned that it's good in dust collection. Uh, moving to your dust collection mm -hmm. for a minute, it looks like you've got one plumbed hard line right. in the shop. Right. That's a fairly late addition. For the longest time, I had flex hoses. And honestly, um, that, they would have worked better if I had hung them from the ceiling. But I had them stretched around on the floor and constantly was stumbling on them. And so I thought, wait a minute, this is a safety factor. 
I, I, this is no good. So my friend Larry Yancey had put piping in, and so I went over to see Larry and said, what do I need? He told me to, what to go get. And he um, gave me some good advice. He said, get the, the longest 90 you can get. Don't get a tight 90. So I, try, I got the longest I could find, and I have put PVC piping in, uh, and it, it has one point here, because that's just as far as I've gone with it. Mm -hmm. But I think I need another point of exit or suction for a smaller pipe. But I'm, I, I read the pluses and minuses of doing that, and um, not real sure where to put it. But if I could put an eight inch pipe on that uh, chop saw, <laughs> I would it do still it. wouldn't be big <laughs> enough. It probably wouldn't be big enough. But anyway, can't do without it, but I constantly battle with it. I think I'm seeing an air hose. Yes. Where's the compressor? Right there okay, on the so floor. You, got a small, small you know, compressor? it is a small uh, compressor. I had a pancake, uh, Porter Cable pancake. And the only way I could use it was with headphones, ear, earplugs. It was the noisiest thing in the shop. It would drive you crazy. So I, um, I allowed that to be sold. In fact, gave it to the club, and I think it went at the garage sale, if I'm not mistake, <clears throat> mistaken. And that's just a little Harbor Freight, um, four gallon. It is quiet as a mouse, and so far does everything that I'm doing. Now, I'm not doing high-powered pressure things. Um, it's mostly blowing out vessels, mm -hmm. um, uh, blowing off different things. Um, it's strong enough, at least spec-wise, to do a pressure pot. So that's about the only other thing that I can envision that I would do. It would blow up a car tire, but it's, it's still a little too heavy to lug it out to the front of the house to do that. But that's the only one I have. I don't have a place. There are certain limitations to a place like this. I don't have a place to put a large compressor, like a little storage place built outside that I could put that in. It just isn't available. So it has to be in this room, and that's a great solution. Well, for a gallon capacity, you've got all the air that you need. I think so. I think so. You mentioned that this is your small wood storage. Where's, where's your big wood storage? I, mean, I know you do some bigger things. Yeah, well, you, as I say, you, you don't think that's enough of, down no, there? Like two okay, pieces? No. okay, okay. Well, I guess there's a reason that I'm known in the neighborhood as the woodmonger. When they see me coming, a tree has either come down or is slated by the city to come <laughs> down. I can't get as much of that as I would like because living in the city, there's just no storage. So Jenny and I have kind of negotiated that I get a little part of a storage building that is also here, but that has to handle yard tools, uh, beach equipment, uh, lots of other th dog food. The, the trade-off for the freezer. That's right. See, you get it. You get it. So that's, that gets my ticket punched that I can put stuff out there. So when I rough turn bowls or a vessel, I either wrap it in plastic and or coat it or whatever I'm going to do to just let it dry slowly, and I put it over there. It gets really hot in the summer, and it gets really cold in the winter because it's not climatized. Behind that, uh, as you saw, we have a fireplace out mm -hmm. there. So we keep firewood back there, but I have a section of that where wood is up off the ground and it's tarped. I don't think that's ideal, and that's not really where I would most want to put it. My dream is to have a, a sort of a lean-to out there where I can put a good supply of turning wood, cut and properly stacked. I'm kind of an orderly freak. Mm -hmm. and, um, but until I get chance, a chance to build that or have it built, that's where it is. So I have stuff that's in process out there. I went out the other day and counted, and I think there's, I don't know how many pieces, but there's a bunch ready to now be finished turned. So that's where stuff is stored. This is where I pull stuff if... I've got to make a bottle stopper, something like that, or a small vessel. Mm -hmm. I'll come look here first, because some of the best wood is in here, as it's been cut out of other wood. Well, this is a very nice little shop. Thank if, you. If, if, if you uh, if, is there anything you'd change? Is there anything you want to do to the shop? I think carefully. Everybody has things they want to do. The only thing I would want and can't, there's just, it's not something I can do, is I would raise the roof. I would get the roof a little higher because it is just a garage height intended for one car. The roof's a little low. And then I came back and insulated it, started to cover it, 
and that was closing things up even more. So I've just left it with the Tyvek like this. Who, who cares? I put the mini split in, and that climatized it so I can work out here all year long. I would recommend to anybody with a shop, if you don't have that and you struggle in the summer and in the winter, put in a mini split. That's a self-installed mini split. And Mr. Cool works fantastically. So raising the roof would be the only other thing I would put I would do. And that's not gonna happen, but that's you ask, so that's my answer. Well, I really appreciate giving us the opportunity to see your shop. If, uh, if anyone has any questions, do you mind if we share your contact information? No, that's fine. I'd be happy well, to talk to him. If, if you'd like to contact John, of course, his phone number is in the registry for the, for the club. Uh, you can also email him. I believe it's jwdaniel, it's D-A-N-I-E-L, at M-E right. dot com. Or that's, that, dot no, com. that's correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you.